Hello, everyone. If you just joined us, we're just holding on for a couple of moments uh, whilst we wait for everyone else who might want to join the webinar tonight. So if you bear with us, we'll be starting in a couple of moments. Hello everyone, so welcome to uh, the second session uh, as part of our library consultation. I think we've got uh, quite a few people now who have joined, so what we'll do is we kick off. Um, so first of all, hello, my name is Stephen Tay. I'm the Director of Growth, Employment and Regeneration here at the Council, and I'm chairing the session tonight. Can I just quickly introduce, please, first of all, um, Councillor Lewis and Rob Hunt. Uh, Councillor Lewis, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Oliver Lewis, and I'm the Council's Cabinet Member for Culture and Regeneration. And Rob. Hi, I'm uh, Robert Hunt, Interim Head of Assets and Involvement, uh, including libraries, museums and leisure. Perfect. So just to give you a little bit of an overview in terms of how the webinar will work today. Um, we've got a, a little bit of an introduction coming up from Council Lewis in a second, uh, then through into Rob Hunt, who's going to take us through some slides to give you a little bit of an explanation. And then we'll follow up then with a question and answer session. Now, uh, you'll see on your screens there you've got the question and answer button. So if you've got any questions throughout this session, put your questions into there. And then what we'll do at the end is we'll pick up those questions and we'll put those to uh, Council Lewis and Rob Hunt and take them through. Uh, I can give you a little bit more detail in terms of how that will uh, work as we get closer to that. Just a reminder for people who uh, who have joined, um, this session is being uh, recorded uh, just so that you're aware. OK, then, so let me pass you across then to um, Councillor Lewis for, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and look, look, first of all, just to say it's really good to see everyone here with us on this webinar this evening. It's great that in Croydon we have so many people who are um, interested in and passionate about our libraries. Um, as you will be aware, you know, the council is in a very difficult financial situation. And I'm not saying that you know, the council hasn't made mistakes, but the roots of that financial situation are very deep. Croydon has for a number of years been um, underfunded. And last year we were not compensated for the full costs of COVID. And as a result of all of that, we are having to take some very tough decisions for services right across the council, including libraries. We're currently in the second phase of our consultation on the future of our library services and I'm pleased that in that first phase of consultation we were able to listen to residents um, from right across Croydon and take closure of some of our libraries off the table and indeed I'm pleased that um, since that first phase we have found additional SIL monies to invest in our libraries including um, a new library in South Norwood. We're now looking at how we might operate our library service going forward and deliver the financial savings that we need to. Um, and there are three broad options. That's uh, running the library service as it currently is run, but um, for two fewer days a week. Um, working with a partner broadly to maintain service levels um, and uh, potentially, um, you know, closing some libraries for a bit of time, but also uh, allowing the community to operate some of our libraries and um, there'll be more information on some of those different options and models I'm sure in the presentation but 
these webinars are in part, in part uh, an important part of the consultation process. And uh, in addition to uh, this online um, meeting, we will also be doing some in-person events at all of the libraries throughout the borough. Um, all options will help us to dramatically reduce our expenditure. Um, but what we need to focus now is how we um, continue to maintain or, or develop our library service um, to the highest possible standards that we can. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. I mean, I'm sure you've all got lots of questions, um, but just wanna finish by saying thanks to everyone for being here with us. And thanks to our hard hardworking library staff for everything they've done and particularly over um, um, the last very difficult year. Thanks, Stephen. Sorry, Stephen, you're on mute. You think in the in the world of webinars and online, you would get used to the mute button. Sorry, everyone. I was just saying thank you very much, Councillor Lewis. Um, I'm going to pass across to you, uh, you Rob, if you'd give us, uh, take us through your information. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, just bear with me just a moment while I, I bring up the uh, slides. Okay, hopefully everybody should be able to see those now. Um, so I'll just run through uh, a number of uh, areas uh, as part of the what we've done so far uh, as an overview of the service, the options that we are uh, proposing as uh, part of the second phase of public consultation, uh, and then into the timescales for uh, through the consultation and decision making. Uh, including our uh, consultation events and then we'll move into a um, at the end a period of question and answer sessions um, so please do use the the Q&A session uh, so just to start off I want to thank you all uh, for attending tonight uh, and for those of you who have submitted your questions in advance uh, and we will get to those and hopefully the presentation uh, will will answer some of those questions as we go through so just to give a, a a brief overview. Um, legislation dictates that as a local authority, we need to provide um, a comprehensive and efficient library service for all pers persons, uh, including all those who live, work or study in the area. Um, and that allows the council either to deliver those services in-house or we are able to work with partner organisations, uh, be that sort of, uh, commercial entities, charities or uh, community groups and organisations for the provision of uh, library services within the borough. Um, and that service should include activities such as uh, learning books, but it could also include uh, learning devices, running different events and activities, access to IT. Um, so it is quite a, a broad range of uh, options that the, uh, can be offered as part of the library service. Um, as we provide that service, uh, the thing, a couple of things that we, we really need to make sure that we, we consider and, uh, is how we encourage adults and children to make uh, full use of the library service and how we lend books and other printed material uh, free of charge for those who live, work or study in the, the local area. And we believe that the, the options that we're presenting as part of the phase two of the public consultation covers uh, that statutory service. So just to provide a, a bit of background as to uh, what's happened within the library uh, service within Croydon over the last few years. Um, so in 2018, uh, the library service came back from uh, Carillion uh, having been outsourced um, and um, came back in at short notice following the, uh, the collapse of Carillion. And we uh, redesigned the service, integrated it back into, uh, into the council, um, restructured the service to make sure that staff were on quoting terms and conditions. Um, and then in 2019, we published uh, the library's plan that covered the 10 year period from 2019 to 2028. Uh, and that library's plan set out the vision uh, for the service, which was to involve, inform and inspire. And there were four main themes that we, we designed um, and that was for uh, a library service that was designed around the needs of our residents and communities. The Croydon Libraries acted as the front door into the council uh, and enabled all services to be delivered locally. That libraries were at the heart of Croydon's cultural offer uh, that 
it had a real emphasis on uh, the written and spoken word, uh, and that we made sure that our buildings were modern, welcoming, inclusive and accessible, uh, so that everybody from within the community could come to, to those buildings and feel like they could use them for uh, a range of events and activities. So more recently, and Councillor Lewis uh, mentioned this in his opening remarks, uh, the council declared a section 114 notice uh, in September 2020 uh, that has required the whole council to, uh, to make savings so that we can live within our means. Uh, as part of those savings proposals, uh, the library service is required to make savings of about half a million pounds uh, in the year 22, financial year 22-23. And for us to, to do that, we need to uh, engage with the local community to find out what a statutory service looks like in Croydon. Um, so on the 14th of January 2021, we launched a formative public consultation uh, that ran until the 14th of March. Um, and at that stage, we, we posed the question, uh, could we close five libraries uh, at Broad Green, Bradmore Green, Sandersted, Shirley uh, and South Norwood, or could we operate them uh, in a way that was cost neutral to, uh, to the council? Um, or were there any other ideas that people might have as to, to how we could operate our library service? And we were really pleased with the, the feedback that we received. Uh, so we got over two and a half thousand survey responses, as well as some other valuable feedback, both from the comments and from discussions uh, and questions that we received uh, during that time and we we've used that feedback uh, to inform the options as part of this second phase of consultation uh, so i'll just go through now uh, some of the things that that you fed back to us and how we have responded to those um so you told us that uh closures would disproportionately impact uh, deprived areas uh, that children young people and the elderly would be most impacted by uh, the proposed changes uh, that after lockdown, uh, libraries are really needed and seen as a value, uh, valued uh, commodity by communities. Uh, and that for particular groups of residents uh, within local communities, they, that they wouldn't be able to travel to alternative uh, library locations uh, for a number of factors, including cost, uh, distance, uh, personal frailty and fear of crime. Um, and so we've listened to that and we've committed to keeping all 13 libraries open. Uh, so just to be, to be clear, the three options that we have proposed mean that none of the 13 libraries would uh, need to close. In addition to that, we got some, uh, some other feedback. Uh, so there was a, a suggestion that we should reduce our hours to make savings. And we've listened to that, and one of the options uh, sorry, two of the options that we proposed um, include a reduction in, in hours, um, which is the first and third option. Um, we also had a, a strong set of feedback uh, that said that people wanted to use libraries outside of normal uh, business hours, um, more convenient times to their working patterns, to, to their lifestyles. Uh, and so we've included Open Plus technology as part of our proposal. Uh, to three additional libraries uh, that would then allow people to access library buildings outside of staffed hours. Um, there were suggestions for community and volunteer run libraries. Um, and one of the options, uh, option two, uh, sorry, option three proposes uh, a hybrid model of council owned at eight libraries uh, and five libraries that are operated by uh, community organizations. And then there were several different options that uh, repeatedly came up as part of uh, income generating ideas for the service. Uh, so uh, having cafes in libraries, uh, making meeting spaces hireable, uh, chargeable desk spaces for small businesses and entrepreneurs, uh, more ticketed cultural events. Um, and so we've, we've listened to that and we're currently in the stage of developing uh, a pilot for several chargeable children's skills based workshops uh, over the summer period uh, and more details will follow shortly uh, on those and what they uh, will include um, and we are also in the, in the process of reviewing our pricing uh, 
search rates for hireable spaces within our library buildings. So I'll just go now into uh, to run through the three different options that have been proposed um, and give some detail around uh, what that actually means uh, for the service and, and you as library users. So following approval from Cabinet and Scrutiny and Overview Panel, uh, the phase two of the consultation focuses on, on three different options. So option one is a reduced service uh, where hours are reduced by 21% across the borough. Um, option two looks at outsourcing all of our libraries uh, to uh, another provider, uh, but preferably to a charity or social enterprise. Uh, and option three is a reduction in service hours uh, by two days a week to eight of our libraries and then the five remaining libraries to be run on a community uh, run basis but still with the library's staff presence uh, and I'll go into more detail um, shortly. So looking at option one, the overall uh, reduction across the in entire library's portfolio is uh, hours would reduce by 21%. Um, We'll try to mitigate that and minimise it in some of our busier libraries, um, which may mean that uh, some of the smaller libraries are, are closed uh, slightly more than 21%, uh, but overall it will be 21%. Um, that would then see a reduction in our staffing levels by 15.99 full-time equivalents uh, or a 25% reduction. Uh, and we believe that that would then save uh, £506,000 um, from our operating budget. Um, this would require the service then to do a staff restructure. Um, but for us, the timescales would have been the council control that gives us um, a greater ability to control how and when we deliver those savings. Uh, so we would reduce staffed operating hours by 207 and a half hours per week but we would mitigate that by adding in 150 additional unstaffed hours per week through the Open Plus technology. Um, we would do uh, an adjustment of our opening days across the borough. So we would make sure that in the north, central and south areas, there would be at least one library open every day, Monday to Saturday, uh, so that there would always be some provision uh, wherever you are uh, within the borough. The second option um, would uh, outsource the library service um, and that would require the procurement of another organisation to come in and run all 13 libraries uh, and the available operating budget would be uh, 2,898,000 um, and we would be clear that that would be uh, the council's offer uh, to that organisation to, to run the libraries. Um, we would expect the same or similar level of service, uh, but we would anticipate that whoever took on uh, the management of those libraries would need to make efficiencies or generate income uh, to operate on, on those levels. Uh, there's a number of different areas that they could potentially look at, and these are just our thoughts as to, to where they may look and just something for you to consider. Um, so they may look to... Uh, utilize their own contracts uh, for the book fund and may find potential savings uh, as part of a, a different contract arrangement. Uh, they would likely uh, change uh, customer uh, self-service, so there'd be more uh, self-service machines, more uh, kiosks that would then free up offices time. Um, there would be uh, they would utilise their own uh, maintenance, utilities contracts uh, under different terms and conditions to the councils uh, and may be able to generate some efficiencies there. Um, if they already have uh, buildings uh, that they operate in the borough, they may look to co-locate and that would be something that they would need to run by the council first uh, to make sure that it was a, a suitable um, alternative, but it's something that they may look to do. Uh, they would likely uh, review their opening times uh, for uh, looking at, at peak times and making sure that 
Uh, they were fully staffed. Depending on the nature of the organisation, they may look to uh, streamline across back office functions. So uh, some the, the individuals who buy uh, books or uh, manage buildings may operate across sev several different uh, locations. Um, and if they were a charitable organisation, they would then be uh, subject to an 80% discount on business rates, uh, which is something the council uh, can't generate. Um, so that's that's something that they could uh, could look to implement. Uh, so from a timescale perspective, procurement and mobilization would likely take between six to 12 months to complete. Uh, that would take us beyond uh, the 1st of April 2022 when we need to make savings. Um, and so if that was the case, then the council would need to make sort of interim uh, savings in year until that operating model was in place. In addition, uh, any operator would likely uh, try to increase paid events and activities to generate more income uh, to meet uh, service delivery within the, the budget that's been set of uh, 2.898 million. And finally, option three, uh, is similar uh, to option one, so there'd be a reduction in our hours by two days a week to the eight libraries that would be run by the council. And then we would uh, offer to the community uh, to run uh, the libraries at Bradmore Green, Broad Green, Sanderstead, Shirley and South Norwood. The council would continue to provide staff two days a week in those buildings. Uh, to make sure that the library element of the service was uh, was running effectively. We would provide book stock as we uh, currently do, uh, and that would be shared across the 13 libraries and the wider library consortium uh, membership. They would still have access to the, uh, the council's digital network and PCs. Uh, they would be part of our library management system, uh, and they would still remain part of the library's consortium. Uh, which is a 17 borough strong uh, libraries network uh, across London and the South. Um, again, there would be staffing reductions by 25%, so that would uh, save £506,000 per year. Uh, and as part of that model, we would look for the community organisation to take management of the building, so it would be on a, a lease arrangement which would mean that the business rates and utilities wouldn't be paid for by the service, and that would save an additional £72,000 per year. So just to run through the timescales, um, we launched the, uh, the second uh, phase of consultation on the 1st of June uh, for an eight week period. Um, so that will run then through to the 26th of July uh, at midnight. Uh, and based on on current timetable um there is a pre-election period uh that starts on the 30th of august and runs through to the 8th of october for the mayoral referendum uh, at which stage the council can't make significant decisions and so the next available cabinet uh that we could go to would be on uh, the 18th of october uh and the the papers for those would be published on the 11th of october uh subject to uh the decision being approved, uh, we would then also look for a uh, sign off at council on the 13th of December, uh, with the papers being published on the 3rd of December. Uh, just to make you all aware that there is a, an opportunity that um, a, a cabinet could be placed in, uh, in August, and if that's the case, then we will notify uh, everybody via the uh, the consultation website uh, and update the timetable uh, and that may see uh, a slightly quicker decision making process. Um, we are hosting uh, a number of events uh, to engage uh, with you all including these webinars so we, we hosted the first on Saturday on the 12th of June uh, and this one tonight on the 15th uh, and then we have uh, we are going around each of the libraries um, from the start of uh, July, so the 2nd of July through to the 16th of July, uh, 
where we will be visiting all of the libraries uh, as well as South Norwood Market um, to meet you all face to face. Um, we will strictly impose social distancing uh, guidelines so we would expect everybody uh, to wear face masks unless medically exempt uh, and to maintain two meter distancing uh, but we'll be there to speak to to everybody. Uh, these dates will be published on uh, the website and also on social media uh, and in the Quote and Guardian. Uh, so please do uh, keep an eye out for those and we're looking forward to, to meeting you all in person. Uh, and at this stage we'll uh, now move across into, uh, into any questions that you may have. Uh, I can see that we've uh, 11 have already been published. Uh, so uh, back over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, so as Rob says, we're going to go into the question and answer session. So what we've got now are a series of questions that some have already been sent in. So I'm going to pick those through. And as Rob says, a number of questions have already come through the Q&A uh, window here as well. What I'm going to try and do is group these together a little bit um, so we get them a little bit by subject area. Um, what I would ask is if anyone's, as you put those questions in, think very carefully about what you're trying to ask. Uh, some people are writing some statements in here at the moment, which is it's all good. We'll, we'll incorporate that into the consultation information. But if you've got any specific questions, please, please set them all out. So, Rob, should we just start off in terms of um, the you, you've just gone through your presentation. There's a couple of questions here around um, the, um, the options, particularly around uh, outsourcing and the community option. Um, it'd be good if you just clarify this question for uh, Philip Tamage. Um, it's around the community uh, piece, um, understanding what sort of interest has come through from that at this moment in time. Um, and then a, a similar sort of follow-up question that comes really um, around what would happen if, if people went for that option and, that, and no one had come forward uh, to run uh, areas. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, so uh, to clarify, uh, we would do a full procurement exercise as part of the, the outsourcing option. Uh, so we would need to go out to test the market to see uh, which providers could potentially uh, meet our, our needs uh, and we're interested in doing so uh, we would do some market testing we would uh, have some pre-qualification questions to make sure that there were suitable organizations and we would then go through a, a full tender exercise to, to find the suitable preferred bidder um, that would have to need to go through uh, all the uh, decision making processes within the council uh, to get that uh, that ratified uh, before we actually appointed a, a provider. Um, we don't have anybody in mind at the moment uh, and we would need to do that that market testing. Um, obviously, COVID has, has impacted significantly on the sector, so we want to make sure that uh, we were doing some some robust testing of, of the market before we actually appointed anybody. Uh, from a community perspective, um, again, we will look to do a, a a tender exercise, so uh, expressions of interest from community groups and organisations who may be interested in, in running uh, community libraries. Um, and that would involve, uh, as I mentioned, uh, expressions of interest, business cases uh, and business models that would be, be tested and, and we would work with community groups to find suitable uh, models uh, that would then uh, operate those libraries um, and the the question about if a suitable provider couldn't be found uh, at that stage it would then be similar to option one really we would continue to to operate the buildings we would have library staff in there two days per week uh, similar to, to option one uh, but it would mean that the, the building then wouldn't be used uh, or available to the community quite as much as uh, through the community run model uh, and we would look to try to work with internal uh, partners and other uh, other groups to to work in the space at that uh, on our closed days. Thank you, Rob. Just a, a question that, that Elizabeth Athish put in around what would happen if you went down this model and one of the the community groups was to fold or to change. How would that be managed? So uh, hopefully that that wouldn't be the case. But we would um, 
we would then take that that service back in house and it, uh, we, it would be a similar operation to, to as i've just described so library staff would be in there two days per week uh, running the library uh, and we would then try to find an, another uh, alternate uh, community group to, to come in and, and run that space uh, and if not we would then just continue with the two days per week perfect thank you and then just finally in terms of those options a little bit of uh, clarity around um, the outsourcing model in terms of looking for any potentially social enterprises or contractors run on that, the process for doing that and how you would, uh, and who's in the market at the moment? Um, there are a number of different providers in the market uh, across the country who may be interested. Um, we would need to, to test the market to find out who would, who would be interested. So just because they're in the market doesn't necessarily mean that they would want to to bid to run Croydon libraries, uh, but we would look to uh, to engage and and advertise to as wider a uh, portfolio as possible of uh, similar providers. Uh, they would be testing to make sure that they were a suitable provider uh, as part of the pre-qualification questions so that they were financially uh, robust, uh, that they, uh, we would look to find uh, providers who have got similar experience running libraries elsewhere. Uh, but that process as to the exact questions that we will be asking hasn't been set at this stage. Thank you, Rob. Um, so one for you, um, Councillor Lewis, um, but just before we get, this is a question that's come from Bavina. Uh, first question was around from how many people are attending the webinar today and there's 38 uh, people at the webinar. Um, the second question was really about South Norwood Library. Um, and about the new library and the plans around that. I don't know whether you want to comment on that at all. Yes, so um, uh, South Norwood Library is currently um, sort of next to the Samuel Corridge Taylor Centre at the end of South Norwood High Street. Um, but as part of a development that's next to Aldi in South Norwood on Station Road, uh, we've been able to bring forward a, a new library space um, given that, you know, we've secured um, SIL money within the council, that's money from um, developments which take place around the borough, um, we are able to fit that out as a, as a brand new library. So there will be a, a new library in South Norwood on Station Road, right in the heart of, you know, everything that goes on. So if you're going to do your shopping at Aldi, you can maybe... Um, you know, pop in and pick up a book as well. And um, when you're on your way back from the city on the train, you know, you can drop off the book that you finished on your journey. So there are, you know, I think it's a better location. It will be um, a great space for the library service and hopefully it will be fit for purpose for many years to come. Thank you very much. I'm just going to turn to this. There's quite a few questions that come in around um, finance and the, the rationale for where we are at this moment in time. The first question um, came from David Lucas, um, just asking about um, understanding the library expenditure and the council financial situation and why we're looking at these uh, measures at this moment in time. I don't know whether you want to comment on that, first of all. Yeah, well, look, I mean, the, 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 the council is broadly in a, in a difficult financial situation. And, you know, as a response to that and as an organisation, we're having to look at all services right across the council um, to find savings to respond to it. And, you know, libraries is no different from that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that through this consultation process, we can find those savings, but also mitigate the impact of them on the service. Um, uh, but, but, you know, no stone in, in the council will be able to be left unturned. All services are going to have to play their part in um, in helping us address the financial challenges that we face. Thank you. Can I, so then just turning to this, there's quite a few questions here around um, the around the proposals and um, the impact that libraries have in terms of the local economy um, and how you're going to try and maintain that. So particularly from um, Lynn Chambers about if you invest in libraries, you create opportunities for education skills, which in turn creates the conditions for future economic growth. So whilst we understand the financial constraint on Croydon Council, uh, do libraries feature as contributing factors in strategic plans for increasing employment and small business growth opportunities? 
Uh, yeah, look, I'd, I'd like to thank Lynn for the, the question. And, and I think, look, I mean, our libraries already do um, an amazing amount of work, really. I mean, in, in lots of ways, we've got 13 flexible workspaces around the borough where people can plug in their laptop, access super fast internet and work away. Um, we're also part of a, a programme called Startups in London Libraries, which is funded by the British Library and the European Union. And um, uh, the, the purpose of that is to give young or, well, not necessarily young, but, you know, entrepreneurs and new businesses the opportunity to access resources and support, um, uh, you know, through our library service. And so I'm really pleased that we've been a part of that and that we have been supporting the local economy and, you know, start our businesses um, to date. And I hope that you, you know, our libraries will be able to play their part in that going forward as well. Thank you very much. Um, maybe one here for you, Rob, around um, the skills um, in terms of library staff. Can you just comment how that would work in terms of some of those options? Yeah, so, I mean, as a service, we very much uh, value the, the hard work and skills that our professional library staff have. Uh, and we've tried to mitigate that through all of the different options. Um, However, the uh, our operating budget uh, is made up, I think it's 63% of the operating budget is made up from uh, staffing costs. And so any reduction in service, unfortunately, is going to have uh, an impact on staffing numbers. Uh, but we do value all the hard work that they, they do, uh, which is why as part of all the options, there will be library staff uh, available through, um, in the buildings uh, several days a week. Um, so they'll be, uh, as part of the first option, uh, staff will be there. Uh, the majority of the time, there'll be uh, library staff within the building, uh, but to allow that flexibility has been requested as part of the, the feedback. Uh, there will be times when people can go in and access the buildings uh, without members of uh, library staff there. Uh, but they still be able to access all the same services so they can uh, self-issue kiosks. They'll be able to uh, access the IT and printing services uh, that they can't currently uh, currently do. Um, we would propose as part of the second option, uh, outsourcing the, the two pin of a staff across to uh, the other organisation uh, and to operate uh, and continue the service at, pretty much as, as we do now. Uh, and the third option, uh, again, the eight libraries will have the, uh, the paid uh, professional uh, library staff there, uh, providing support uh, for the majority of the time. Um, and the five libraries would have professional library staff uh, available two days per week. Uh, we would provide uh, some training uh, to be able to uh, allow volunteers from the community groups to be able to support the library service while uh, staff aren't there. Uh, but we do, val we do value and we know that you value uh, having library staff, uh, which is why we've made sure that they are an integral part of all the options. Thank you. This, I think this question follows on a little bit from there and it's come from, from Don um, and I think it's really in, in two parts uh, and maybe councillors you want to pick up around the London uh, living wage element here but Don says one fact not mentioned is the skill level of library staff. If the operation is contracted out their staff may not have the necessary knowledge to provide advice and literary knowledge which most of your existing staff have. Subcontracting would lead to lower paid personnel as a standard commercial cost saving product. The position of a librarian cannot be compared with the stock control staff or general shop assistants. I've used the librarians as research assistants. I don't know if you want to pick up uh, councillors around the London living wage first of all, and then Rob, is there anything else you want to pick up around skills? Look, I mean, um, I think it's it's really important, and you know, I was um, uh, uh, in my opening remarks, I was you know clear to thank library staff for everything that they do. You know, on the front line of council services, um, working with members of the public day in, day out, supporting them in lots of different ways. Um, we have a great, a great team of, of library staff in Croydon. And, 
you know, whoever was to run the, the library service going forward, you know, we would try and protect as many um, roles as possible. And hopefully, um, you know, lots of our staff, if it was, you know, a partner running the service, would transfer across. So there wouldn't be a complete change in the nature of our staff cohort, but, um, you know, a lot of our current staff would transfer across to work in the service under a partner organisation. Um, uh, and, you know, look, I mean, we can um, write into contracts and that kind of stuff, um, it, you know, that we want to see certain standards and, and levels of service maintained. And I hope that, you, you know, whoever's running the, the library service going forward will take pride in the service, will look to um, skill up their staff and seek to um, get as many inputs and um, benefits into our library service um, uh, you, you know, running it in a completely different way to how it was when Carillion ran the service, and um, you know, several years ago. Thank you, Rob. Did you? Is there anything in there that you wanted to pick up at all? No, I don't think I've got anything to add to that. Perfect. Um, so, just going back to the South Norwood Library, there's a couple of questions that, that popped up around that again, and maybe Councillor Lewis, you can pick this up with your planning hat on. Um, so, there's a question around SIL. Why can SIL money be used for South Norwood when most of the SIL comes from the south of the borough, yet is never used there? For instance, it was previously suggested that SIL could be used to maintain libraries neglected by Carillion, especially those, uh, those five libraries in line to be run by community. But this plan seems to have been dropped. Um, there's a factual error in the question in that most of the SIL money um, generated in the borough doesn't come from the south of the borough. Most of it is, uh, would be generated by big developments in the town centre um, and elsewhere. Um, there is a charging schedule that is on the, on the council's website, which shows you know, the amount of sill that we collect every year and how we, how we distribute it around the borough. We do um, try and use it um, in line with the council's strategic priorities to invest in schools and um, in libraries and other services. And um, it also funds, um, you know, things like council award budgets. So that's a good way actually of getting a very even distribution of SIL to communities right across the borough. So we have to be careful when we chuck out kind of statements like um, the one in the question. Um, there's always a slightly more complex, um, uh, you know, um, uh, nature to these things. And I think that um, the important thing to remember is that we um, have secured still monies, not just for South Norwood, but actually to invest in libraries right across the borough to get high speed internet, to improve um, the look and feel of our libraries. You know, I was um, at Selsden Library a couple of years ago, reopening it um, after a, a, a refurbishment there and really proud that we could invest in Selsden Library and in that community. So, um, you know, look, um, uh, the investment in our libraries will be um, in all of our libraries across the borough. So I think it's important to say. Thank you. And, I, and just one more question that, that follows through in terms of the South Norwood Library piece. And that was around why would you want to move from a freehold building into a leasehold building? I think uh, on that, we know that the, the existing building uh, has uh, some repairs issues that uh, was the original reason for, for moving to, uh, to Station Road, uh, as well as the prime location that the uh, Station Road sat in to increase footfall through the building and the accessibility to the wider local community. Uh, so there are advantages to, to moving from the existing to the new site. Thank you. So there's a couple of questions coming up here around um, um, the impacts in terms of services that provide us. The first question really is around um, what child, around children's services, and they've come from Pravina. Um, will children's services uh, include after school, including after school club for primary and secondary school aged kids? Will that be affected, and will that will that continue to be uh, offered? So we will. Uh, we'd welcome people's feedback. Uh, as part of the consultation process as to uh, areas that they think we could potentially uh, adjust as part of our, our three options. Um, so uh, whether that is around some of the opening time. So at, at the moment we have 
try to be very clear about days uh, that will be open uh, for specific buildings in each of the, uh, the hubs, north, central and south. Um, but we are we're willing to, to listen to, to feedback on that if there needs to be adjustments for, uh, for local need. Uh, however, uh, we do uh, believe that the, the after school clubs are a, a valuable service that the, uh, the library service offers back to the community and to, to young people in our borough. So um, we would look to continue uh, those wherever possible. Thank you. And, and uh, one that follows through a little bit from that, um, how will the cuts affect the quality of books available? Will popular new books be ordered in? I find that children's books in the new Addington Library are not interesting or up to date. Uh, could do with more to encourage children of primary age to read. Um, yeah, look, I'd like to thank M. Walker for the question. Um, I think that Look, inve investing in, in children's books and, and in services for young people is, is really important. Um, I'm really proud, actually, that, you know, a little while ago, we were able to invest a little bit more money in our book stock. And um, we were also able to access the, uh, the London Consortium of Libraries that um, uh, enabled us to, um, to get more books um, to be available for our residents. Um, Obviously, um, there's a long way to go and there is a lot of refresh that is needed in our bookstock. Um, but if there are particular titles that you want or there are specific books um, uh, that you would like the library to carry, um, you know, do pass those recommendations on to um, members of staff because um, that can be really helpful when we're, we're buying books so we can get the, the, the right sort of books that residents in Croydon want. Thank you very much. Can I just turn then to um, some of the technologies that are going to be available um, within the uh, in, uh, library? So, for example, Open Plus. There's a question here that's come from Judy. Is there a, an online? Is there an online a description of the Open Plus technology? If not, could it be briefly summarised? Uh, yeah. So there is uh, on the library's uh, consultation website. One of the documents down at the bottom of the page uh, is a, an overview of what Open Plus is and, and how it is used. Uh, but just as a, uh, a brief overview for you, for you all this evening, uh, Open Plus is, uh, utilizes the uh, library card membership. So you have to be a library member to use it and you have to be pre-registered to be able to use Open Plus. Um, but what that does is you use your library card and a pin number that you're given. Uh, you would access the building outside of uh, normal staffing hours. Uh, so the doors would be closed. You'd walk up, you'd put your uh, membership card on there and your, your PIN number. The doors would then uh, open to allow you access into the building. Uh, you would then be able to uh, undertake normal uh, activities as you, as you would in the library. So you can uh, use a self-service kiosk. Uh, you can uh, log on and use the IT equipment, you can use the printing, uh, you can pay fines, um, and all of that would be monitored uh, through our CCTV. Um, so uh, any issues could then be uh, quickly picked up. Um, there is a, a level of responsibility on, uh, on the user, which is why we would have a uh, that sort of... Uh, pre-access check. Uh, so you would be re responsible for making sure that nobody tailgates you into, into the building, uh, for reporting any issues uh, while you're in there, um, and then for, for leaving the building uh, at the uh, allotted time, um, which there would then be warnings uh, sort of identifying that it was about to close. Uh, so that is sort of generally how the principle works, but it does allow people to, to access outside of staffed hours. Thank you, Robert. And I believe that there is an online uh, explanation, isn't there? And I think that's been shared with Judy now, so you can, so you can see that. Um, and so, sorry, Laura, I, you, you pointed out I missed your question from earlier on. Um, and your question was about, um, really pu puzzled that, you're, uh, that you are full of ideas for outsourcing to save money via better contracts for maintenance stock, utility, etc. But no thoughts about doing these things yourself. Why? 
Well, look, I think I think a lot of this um, sort of thing, um, you, you know, is already done by the library service. Um, we run a pretty lean ship as it is, but you know, we are having to reduce the cost of the service by half a million pounds a year. And so if we were to work with a partner organisation, we would be looking to those sorts of areas um, uh, for the partner organisation to make that level of saving. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, we already do a lot, but perhaps, um, perhaps there is more that can be done by a different organisation. Yeah, sorry, just to, to add to that, we are considering uh, trying to implement savings through all of those uh, areas, but there are certain things that aren't available to us as a council and within the uh, the contracts that we currently have uh, available um, or uh, within the the structure of the organisation as a council, we don't qualify for, uh, for business rate relief, uh, which is a, a significant proportion of uh, of our revenue budget so it's there are certain things that we we can't get around uh that an outsourced charitable organization would be uh receive the benefit of thank you rob and uh, this almost follows in the same vein but it's focused very much around uh, option one around the savings and it's come from agent uh you mentioned that the current need for the council makes substantial savings however if often one was selected the management libraries would largely remain unchanged so would we then uh, plan to restore opening and staffing back to the current level once accounts financials are stable again? If so, when, uh, when do you hope that would happen? Look, I mean, that is one scenario that, you know, when the council is um, back on a stable financial footing, we could look to reinvest in our libraries if we, if we ran them in-house. Um, but... Uh, another scenario might be that, you know, if, if that takes two or three years further on down the line, the council might be looking for additional savings. So we might have to, uh, you, you know, whilst we've reduced the service by 21%, the council might ask us to reduce the service even further. Um, um, so um, I, I, I couldn't put a, put a time scale on it, though. I think the um, MTFS um, um, is three years, um, uh, but, you, you know, there's all sorts of different legislative changes and societal and cultural challenges that we have to address as a council. So, um, you, you know, those timescales could, could shift and change. Um, um, but, you know, hopefully one day we will be in a place where we can um, uh, invest in our libraries and um, develop the service going forward. Thank you very much. Um, so just reflecting on some of the questions that are coming in, quite a lot of statements here around um, the different services run within lives, particularly in relation to uh, children's service and homework clubs. And I think um, we've answered the question in terms of, of our ambition um, around that. Um, if there are any other questions, please keep putting them through the question and answer uh, chat. I think they're all of you can. There was a question earlier around people being able to see them. You should be able to see all the questions that are being asked as they come through. Um, so there's a question here um, around the cost around technology and some of those changes. Um, and I assume this is in relation to Open Plus technology. How much would it, uh, will the new technology cost to set up and where, do, where it does not exist? And how much would it cost to maintain? What happens if there's an issue out of hours? Just wondering how much offset against salary savings and are there any rules against uh, overfunding and children's books? over uh, yeah, crowdfunding and children's books. So really th there's a question in three parts. First one is about, tell us a bit about uh, the costs about technology. Tell us how that technology works, I assume in terms of the out of hours service. Um, how does that offset staff savings um, and how, how can you generate more income? Uh, okay, so uh, the uh, so the first part of that was around the sort of the costs for uh, for implementing the the new technology. So uh, we have received uh, capital funding for uh, installation of Open Plus technology into uh, three additional libraries. Uh, so it's currently already in uh, Selsden, uh, Norbury, and will be in the New South Norwood, uh, and we would look to extend that to another three libraries. Um, we believe that that would cost, and again, we would need to go out to procure uh, 
this work and it will de depend on the design of each individual building and any sort of uh, FM work that may need to take place to allow that to happen. But we believe that may be in the region of about £40,000 per building. Um, in addition, we also need to procure uh, new kiosks across all of our library buildings. And we know we need to do that because uh, the existing ones are coming towards the end of their uh, operable life, uh, just the, over a period of time. Uh, and there are new technologies within there that we'd like to utilize, such as contactless card payments, uh, linking in with the, the net loan scheme to be able to uh, allow access to uh, digital sessions, uh, through the kiosks so um we would uh also looking to procure that um and again we, that will be dictated by market forces uh but we do have the capital money uh, set aside uh for that uh regarding out of hours uh issues uh with the technology uh some of our busier libraries will have more than one kiosk uh, if it was a, a self-service kiosk that uh, had a problem. Um, we will need to work through the, the exact details of uh, of how sort of any uh, technological issues would be, uh, be reported. Um, and we will, uh, yeah, we will work on that uh, over the coming weeks and months uh, to make sure that that's in place by the time that uh, we launched Open Plus across the library service. Um, are you okay to just ask the, the remaining two points of the question again, please, Stephen? Yep, let me get back to that question again. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me. I can't find it back into my list. Can I ask you another question and I'll come back to that one and find that again for you. Um, let me, I'll come back to it. So there's a question here from Sally Ward-Lee, um, and this is really about the timelines um, that we've got around the procurement exercise. Maybe I'll break this down into, into two parts. And so the first one is around particularly um, the community run model for libraries. And the question is, how can you do this in such a short time span? Uh, are you planning to do some sort of speed dating exercise? Um, this is the first part of that question. We would look to do a, a tender exercise. Uh, so once we, we have a decision, which is uh, currently based around uh, a final decision at a uh, council, full council meeting in December, uh, we would then look to go out for expressions of interest um, for from community groups for each of the, the five libraries in question. Uh, and we would uh, do a, a procurement exercise to make sure that all interested parties had an opportunity to uh, to demonstrate that uh, they had the capability to uh, to operate the library, um, what events, activities, services they would be offering back to the community, uh, and that they got a uh, a business model that was sustainable. Um, we think that would probably take about six months to complete. Uh, so again, uh, as I mentioned with the, the outsourcing model, uh, taking six to 12 months to complete, we think we could, uh, have community, uh, groups potentially running libraries from summer, uh, 2022, uh, based on, uh, current timescales. So, and the... The, f the follow on bit is around the um, timelines to bring it forward to August um, and just talking about ability to go through the engagement that we need to do and the work we need to do in that time. Is it is it possible, Rob? Is that a very tight timeline? It is a tight time timeline, uh, but the, the team are set up uh, to be able to, to analyze the, the results as they, they come back into the service. We're monitoring uh, throughout the, the consultation process, uh, the uh, feedback that we're, we're receiving, uh, we are looking at any uh, gaps uh, within sort of demographic information and community groups uh, or pockets of the community that uh, may not have returned reasonable uh, rates so that we can uh, 
we can start to to target those groups and, and make sure that we're getting feedback from from everybody within the community. Uh, and as part of that process, we'll be we'll be monitoring sort of uh, how the results are going to then allow us to be able to uh, to do the analysis as we as we go along to revise it uh, towards the end to allow us to to meet that August uh, timeline, if necessary. Uh, if not, then uh, we'd be doing that work over a slightly longer period uh, to go to October, uh, October cabinet meeting. Thank you very much. So just there's a, there's a question here that's come um, from Caroline, which is going back to the question around the um, uh, the homework clubs, the other activities that happen with the libraries and the concern that some of those will drop away. Can you just give that reassurance again in terms of the aspiration? Yeah, sure. Uh, and yeah, sorry if it, if it wasn't clear earlier, uh, we are still committed to making sure that uh, li uh, homework uh, clubs, reading uh, clubs, um, lots of the events and activities that currently take place in library buildings will continue. Uh, obviously that would need to happen in a, a more condensed uh, time scale within each of the, the libraries, uh, but yet we would uh, still give that commitment uh, to deliver those, uh, those services. Thank you. There's a specific question here that's come from um, Judy, who's talking about uh, Shirley Library. Um, would it be possible to develop the existing building in order to expand the floor area, or would that be difficult or impossible to achieve in, pra in practice, owing to the small site and the building's listed status? Um, look, I, I think it, it would be difficult in practice. Um, I'm not sure Shirley Library is listed, but um, I think it's uh, a sort of building of, of note potentially in the area. It's certainly um, got a, you know, a, a people hold it fondly in their hearts. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, potentially very expensive and, and, and difficult to, to extend the building, but, um, you know, hopefully we can continue library services within the current footprint and, and maintain our, as, as high a level of service as possible going forward. Thank you. Um, so just a call out again for any other questions that might be that you might want to be answered or ones you might have th thought that have been missed within this. If you please just pop it into the Q&A box. We're starting to come to the end for the questions that are that are being asked here. Um, so be very useful with any other ones you think I've missed. Please just drop them in here and just a, a comment from uh, Elizabeth here in terms of how those questions pop up in the Q&A box. They go as people drop them in, um, they, they appear and then they carry on up the list depending upon the time stamping of that. And I'm just trying to do my best to bring them together a little bit so we'll answer them in some sort of order. So um, my question, so are there any other questions, that, any burning questions that people want to be asked here? I'm looking through what I've asked so far and I think I've covered all the questions unless people want to put anything else into the chat here. So anything else that people want to want to be asked? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Rob probably just do a quick summary of those options again. So everyone's got them, them clearly in their in their mind. Yep. So if there's um just as a, a brief overview of the, the three options that are available. So the option one is uh, a reduction by 21% across uh, our service hours across all libraries, uh, all 13 libraries, um, that would make uh, a saving of uh, £506,000 uh, per year. Uh, there would be a reduction in staffed hours that would then be mitigated with the introduction of open plus non-staffed hours. Um, but we would retain all 13 libraries under council control. Um, option two is outsourcing of those libraries, uh, all 13, to uh, a provider. Uh, our preference would be to uh, a charity or a social enterprise, but we would make sure that uh, services were offered in uh, across uh, similar hours, uh, same service uh, hours, but may need to be uh, refined. That provider would then need to, to look for any efficiency savings or income generating ideas that they may have 
uh, to be able to operate that service within the available budget of uh, £2,898,000. And then the third option uh, would then be a hybrid model, which looks at eight libraries being uh, retained under council control uh, with a reduction by two days per week uh, across those libraries and five libraries. So Broad Green, Bradmore Green, Sandersted, Shirley and South Norwood libraries to be operated by community um, community groups and uh, the library service would continue to operate in there two days per week uh, with book stock, IT support uh, and remaining part of the library's consortium uh, as part of that offer. Thank you, Rob. Just got a question here from um, Sally. It's a question related to the um, uh, the webinar on Saturday, a point of clarity. Um, so regarding the options to outsource all libraries, you stated that if, company, if a company is appointed to run our libraries, they would have the power to relocate or merge two libraries. This was stated, but not clarified in, a, in any way at last Saturday's webinar. Does that mean that they could close one library in order to merge with another? Can you please explain? So while that wouldn't be our intention, um, as part of the offer of the operator, if they already have buildings in local communities that may be in better locations or better serve the community, uh, we would expect them to be able to, to demonstrate that to the council. Um, and as part of that, we would have to, to consider any options for, for changes, but that may be a way that they feel that they could make efficiencies within the service. Uh, we would expect, if that was the case, uh, that it would be in the right location, offering the right hours, uh, it would be accessible. But at this stage, it was just as a, it's a suggestion that potentially a uh, provider could look to do that. Uh, but it's not something that we are suggesting uh, or expecting from providers. Uh, we would still like them to operate within the, uh, the 13 library buildings that we currently have in the portfolio. Thank you. Um, so there's a, a question here um, from Charmaine. Um, please could you repeat the times for the consultation for Shirley Library on the 12th of July and where as a retired librarian, I register interest in volunteering. So I think that the times are 12.32, just check if that's, if that's right. And where would someone register if they wanted to volunteer? Uh, so I, if I bring up the, the slide again, that's got all the, the details on. Uh, just bear with me one, one second. Uh, hopefully that is, uh, is now visible to, to everybody. Um, for registering interest in, in volunteering, we do have a, a dedicated uh, volunteer, but if you want to put your details through uh, the library's consultation email address, uh, that is being monitored and will be passed on to the relevant member of staff who will uh, then get back in touch with you uh, or visit your local library. Uh, the email address is librariesconsultation at croydon.gov.uk uh, and the details are on the, uh, the final slide. Um, just in case you, you didn't catch that. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I'm jumping around a little bit now um, with some of the questions that are coming in. Can I just go back to the South Norwood Library? And there's a question here from Verena. By, and the question is, by moving South Norwood Library to a smaller space, how do you plan to accommodate volunteer-run, community-run courses or meetups where there'll be less staffed hours? So the new South Norwood Library design is to be a flexible space uh, that would allow uh, different community groups to operate uh, in those spaces. Uh, we would welcome uh, volunteers to, to work alongside library staff or uh, as part of the community run model with community groups uh, to operate that space safely and effectively. Um, the um, the current design has flexible uh, shelving units. That means that certain parts of the building can be, uh, although still open, would be uh, would be more shielded uh, to allow uh, events and activities to take place. 
particular sort of training events um, or skills based uh, activities um, in different parts of the different parts of the building. Thank you. Um, question here about um, volunteering from Judy. Uh, will the council invite uh, volunteers willing to help provide library services unpaid? This might help to identify potential viability of proposals to involve local community associations. Uh, look, I'd, I'd just like to come in first, Stephen. We already have a fantastic cohort of volunteers who help in our libraries um, on the Summer Reading Challenge and, and other programmes. Um, I, I, look, I, I thank staff and it's important to thank um, the volunteers that support the service as well. So thanks to all of them that, that do um, great work. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to, to get involved in the library service as a volunteer already. And um, I'm sure there'll be lots going forward as well. Thank you very much. And there's a, there's a point of clarity that Elizabeth Athers has raised around um, the existing staff, Rob, uh, around Tupi and how that might work in terms of new uh, contracts. And I assume to a certain extent, you know, th this is part of that, that wider understanding about what we would do. Um, do you want to comment at all in terms of those savings that you originally talked about? Uh, yeah, so uh, as a provider uh, came in, we would expect staff to be tupid across uh, on existing terms and conditions. Uh, there would be uh, expectations around uh, the terms and conditions, uh, minimum levels that we would expect staff to uh, be employed upon. Um, and uh, I suppose over a period of time, uh, it's not sort of, uh, unimaginable that uh, there would be a harmonisation process to to move uh, staff that Jupiter across onto uh, the new provider's terms and conditions. Um, but we would expect those to be within, uh, so at least at the, the minimum uh, that we'd set. Um, and then around the savings, it would be down to the individual provider to demonstrate to us how they would expect to make those savings uh, or income generation. So uh, last year we operated on a, a budget of 3.4 million. Uh, we need to make half a million pounds worth of savings. Uh, so that's the um, 2.898 million uh, that's been specified. The provider has the opportunity to, to make those savings uh, to, to meet that uh, budget uh, either through savings or through income generation or a combination of the two. Um, and we would expect uh, that uh, to be to be reinvested back into uh, into the service over time. Thank you, Rob. I've got two questions, two very similar questions here, one from Carol and one from Amelia. Um, so Carol's questions are, is other councils have faced similar budget constraints. Do you know any of any other councils that have implemented the outsourcing model effectively? And Amelia says, hello, um, please, I'd like to know if there are similar processes taking place in other boroughs throughout the UK, or is this unprecedented, unprecedented and pioneering? Thank you. If I take the second question first, sorry, Councillor Lewis. Yeah, well, look, uh, maybe I'll come in, Robin. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, look, I, I just think it's important to to note that over six hundred libraries have closed nationally, so it's not a, a situation that's unique to Croydon. But I think you know, Croydon might be different to some other places in that we are trying to fight hard to keep all of our libraries open and not see any closed. Um, Obviously, that requires a little bit of change and flexibility from um, you know, communities and individuals and, and stakeholders. But you know, I hope at the end of this, we do end up with um, you know, libraries we can be proud of that provide, that continue to provide a fantastic service for our residents. So um, you know, look, the, the, the pressure on local authorities um, 
you, you, you know, is, is, you know, right across the country is, is immense, actually. And um, local authorities over the last um, 10 years have um, really suffered at the hands of government austerity. Um, the government have put extra responsibilities on the local government and not paid them sufficiently for that. And so, um, you know, frontline services, including libraries across the country, um, have been affected. Um, in Croydon, we are trying to protect our frontline services and maintain, um, you know, excellent standards in our libraries. Um, and I hope we can work with residents and communities across the borough in order to do that. Thank you. And yeah, to add to that as a uh, as an example of another consultation that's taking place at the moment. Uh, so Bolton Council are currently uh, consulting with their residents. They've got 10 libraries um, and a museum and archive service. Um, and they need to make £430,000 worth of savings. And their suggestion is through uh, a reduction in hours. So we very similar circumstances um, and similar savings targets uh, based upon the size of the service uh, and a similar approach. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm coming to the end of the questions that are being asked again. Um, so there's a couple here uh, to go through. Anything else people want to ask, please drop them into the Q&A box. Um, so uh, Verena, there's a question here around South Nord Library, and maybe we need to pick this up outside the, the webinar here. This, it feels like it's a little bit more of a detailed conversation. And I would suggest that if you email the library consultation email, we can, we can pick this up directly for you. But the, your question was talking about some of your concerns around how the South Norwood Library would work, and um, particularly with movable shelves, et cetera, within the community groups. And we need to we'd probably pick that up a little bit better at, at outside of the, the webinar. Um, there was a question here uh, around um, if, if outsourcing of libraries hasn't worked in the past, um, will this work? Uh, will this work again? I don't know if Councillor Lewis, do you want to pick, pick this up? or? Yeah, or look, I, I, I think it's important that we do learn from the past. Um, the arrangement that previous administrations on the council came to with Carillion was really disastrous for the library service and for Croydon. And that's why I've been really um, at pains to stress how different any arrangement that we might come to with a partner organisation, um, you know, would be, uh, would be different to what went before. Um, obviously, Carillion were a profit-making or supposedly a profit-making enterprise and so we're skimming money off the top of the library's contract. But we would look to work with um, uh, an organisation that potentially didn't have that, um, uh, you, you know, uh, desire to take money out of the service, but was, um, you know, looking to, to maintain standards and, in, and improve our, our library service. So um, I think that, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the questioner makes a good point, but you know, our intention going forward would be to deliver a service that was very different to what was delivered under Caridian in the past. Thank you. And that question came from uh, Pavina and also from Stephanie there. Um, Stephen, so sorry, can I just come into sure. the question? Uh, so as part of uh, our design or refurbishment of Selsden Library and Norbury Library, we have put similar flexible uh, shelving units in place. So the... Uh, they can be moved by staff, but not by members of the public. Uh, so uh, they are in place at the moment across uh, some buildings and do offer that flexible uh, ability to change the layout of uh, the building at, at short notice uh, to meet the needs of community groups sort of, and activities and events. Thank you very much, Rob. So I think I've got one more question here that hasn't been asked yet, which I'm going to come to in, in a second. I think after that, it'd be worthwhile just, Rob, if you could just do that summary of those consultation dates again, just flip them up on the screen so people can see where the, uh, the next steps uh, across that. Um, so the question comes, and it, it's a question that was asked on, on Saturday, and I think maybe a question that, that you asked on, on Saturday, Janet, around Open Plus. So Open Plus would have CCTV monitored, monitoring and if there was an instant suitable resources, e.g. the police would be immediately called. So would they be called? Both women and people with disability would be discriminated against if this was not the case. Um, look, I mean, uh, we take safety and um, uh, our users feeling comfortable in our libraries um, very um, seriously. Um, 
I want to be clear that if we were to move forward with open plus technology in our libraries, um, we would be monitoring the libraries with CCTV. And if there was an incident, suitable resources like the police would be immediately called. Um, I can't be clearer than that. Thank you very much. Rob, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Are you... No, Councillor Lewis has covered that. Perfect. Um, so one last question here um, around the old South Norwood Library um, before we move on to that, the consultation summary there. Um, would the old South Norwood Library be used for community activities due to smaller space avail availability in the new library? Or do, uh, do the council have plans to sell off the old library? Look, I think... Um... It, we've talked about some of the financial challenges already and it's very unlikely that the council will have the resource to maintain two buildings and um, I think that um, Rob has talked about the flexibility uh, in the new library space so uh, we can provide um, a, a fantastic library in an improved location and um, but also use that space for community um, events and other activities so um, uh, the intention would be for all of that activity to happen in the new library. Thank you very much. Rob, there, so there aren't any other questions that have come up uh, since then. Rob, do you want to take us through the dates for the consultation before I come to you, Councillor Lewis, for uh, closing remarks at all? So hopefully you can all uh, see the slides. Um, so, the first face-to-face uh, -face consultation will take place on the 2nd of July uh, and on that date will be at Sandersted Library between 11 and half past 12 uh, and then at Pearly Library between 2 and half past 3. Uh, on the 3rd of July we'll be at South Norwood Market uh, to uh, meet as many people as possible uh, on market day uh, close to the new South Norwood Library. Um, on the 5th of July, uh, we'll be at Norbury Library uh, between half past nine and 11 o'clock. And then in the afternoon, at Broad Green Library uh, between half past 12 and two. On the 7th of July, we'll be at Thornton Heath Library in the morning, uh, 11 till half past 12. And then South Norwood Library, half past one until three. On the 9th of July, uh, we'll be at Coulsdon Library, 11 till uh, 12.30. And then Bradmore Green, uh, half past two till four. On the 12th of July, uh, we'll be at Ashburton Library, half past nine till 11, uh, and Shirley Library, half past 12 till two. And then on the 13th, uh, we'll be at Selsden Library, uh, 10 till 12, and New Addington Library, half past one till three. And finally, on the 16th of J July, we'll be at Ash uh, Central Library um, for the majority of the day between 10 and four. Um, just to, to caveat that, uh, that is based on current social distancing guidelines, which uh, may change. So please do adhere to, uh, to the guidelines. Um, we will uh, be looking to meet as many people as possible, uh, more on a one-to-one -one small group basis uh, as social distancing guidelines allow. Thank you very much. Um, so just to say to everyone, there's going to be a poll popping up on your screen shortly. And I would ask if you wouldn't mind just to complete that. This helps us in terms of us understanding what we need to do in terms of this, the, in terms of our future consultation uh, events and helps us shape that going forward. That should be popping up in, in a couple of moments. Can I pass across to you, Councillor Lewis, for any uh, comments that you wish to make at the stage? Sure. Thanks, Stephen. i um, just like to say thank you to everyone who has attended and participated. Thanks for all the questions. Um, I'll preemptively apologise if we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, you know, if it's the start of the conversations. There's lots of um, events that Rob outlined. So do come along to one of those if you can. And if you can't, um, look, do drop me an email, oliver.lewis at croydon.gov.uk, and I'll endeavour to come back to you. Um, um, yeah. But thanks for attending. Uh, I appreciate the time that people have taken. Thank you very much. And thank you for completing the poll. I can see people doing the poll there. And just to say, all those questions are really, really helpful. We pick those all up and they all part, come part of our frequently asked questions. So if we have missed any of your questions, they will be wrapped up into those frequently asked questions and we, you'll be able to see all those coming forward. 
Okay, thank you very much. It just leaves me uh, the opportunity to say thank you very much to Councillor Lewis for your time tonight and to, to Rob for your time in, in terms of the presentation and answers. And thank you very much to all the staff behind the scenes that made this work tonight. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Goodbye.